Welcome back, Lecture 26. We are uh, actually kind of going to go off the syllabus a little bit today and get a little bit ahead, but uh, we have a test coming up, so I, I think it's probably a good thing that we end up just slightly ahead. Um, we've got some web assign questions uh, on Chapter 7 pending. Um, let's get through kind of the, the meat of 7.5 if we don't get to all the examples. Um, today we don't have to because we have Monday to do this also. And then we'll look at some web assigned questions, time permitting. All right, 7.5 talks about the logistic equation. So logistic growth is very similar to uh, exponential growth, or what I guess would be more appropriately called uninhibited exponential growth, early in the picture. So for short values, short time runs, or small values of t, it, everything looks pretty exponential in nature. But what we've got later on is some constraints in the problem that cause us to have some limiting value or some carrying capacity. And as we get closer and closer to that, the population growth rate begins to taper off. And you can see that it's flattening out to the point where it's practically zero as you work your way out to the right. So we want the differential equation that illustrates that to show that as the population gets closer to L, this limiting value, that the rate of change of population gets closer and closer to zero. So I think you'll see that in the differential equation. And then the task, most of the task today, is to take that differential equation and solve it for p. So the differential equation for the logistic growth kind of looks very exponential initially. In fact, if we stop there, that is the model that gets us p equals p0 times e to the kt. But there's another term, and I'm going to change a letter from your book. Um, this is actually in the book a lowercase k, and they use another capital K down here. I'm going to call that L for the limiting value, just to keep the k's and the l's separate as opposed to a lowercase k and a capital K. So the rate of change of population is directly proportional to the population. That certainly enters the picture. But this extra term, and we're going to look at, not in depth like this, but we're going to look at a couple of other models, that uh, when you look at the additional piece, you kind of want to think about what that might mean to the rate of growth of population. Well, let's go back to this fact right here. If P approaches L, what happens to this quantity in parentheses? Okay, if P and L are practically the same, that means numerator and denominator are the same. This is 1 minus 1, which is 0. So the rate of change of population gets very, very close to 0. So that's what that term is doing in this particular. So it's allowing what we want to happen to actually happen in terms of the description of the population growth rate. So it is a separable differential equation, it'll be the testiest one that we've had yet. So it's going to take several minutes to get to a point where we can solve this for p. So let me rewrite it so we've got room to do what we need to do. So we would multiply both sides by dt. That's pretty common. And what? Divide both sides by p? <coughs> and l's a number, so this is some function of p as well, so we want to divide by that also. And you can do those both at the same time, but I'm just kind of moving one term at a time. So 
So I think we've cleared everything out of the right side except for the K and the DT and all the terms that had P that were in a product setting on the right side now are in a quotient setting on the left side. Um, anybody want to tackle this right now at this stage? Uh, P is the variable, so it'd be like 1 over x dx, so we can't do anything with the P value here or the P value here. One thing we can do to avoid fractions within fractions is to multiply this fraction by L over L, so that leaves us with an L in the numerator and this L in the denominator. I'm going to multiply it by the second term to kind of clear the fractions. So that'd be L minus P. Is that correct in the second one? If we didn't have L's and P's, if we had numbers and X's, I guarantee you that most of you would know what to do. So let's say for L, I'm just writing this off to the side, let's say L is 100. And instead of P's, we had X's. And that was the problem that we were facing. Prove me right here now. So what would you do with this if you were going to try to integrate it? What would you do, I'll give you a hint, prior to integrating it? Somebody said it. Partial fractions. Okay because we've got a linear term here and a linear term here, right? So we could decompose that into partial fractions. If we do that, we'll get a natural log and another natural log uh, because they both have constant numerators. So that becomes the task at this point in time with this part of the problem. So eventually we're going to integrate both sides. We're not going to do that until we decompose this into partial fractions. L is a number the bottom and make you P squared? Um, okay. That's, I like the thought because, I, I mean, those are things that you should say to yourself, I don't want to do partial fractions because it takes too much work. What if I distributed the P to the L and the P to the minus P? Then we'd have a P squared down here. Mm -hmm. I, I'm all for it. Now now what? Make you P squared. There's okay. no P in the numerator for but, okay, let's go. So you would let u, so all this is good thought stuff, you'd let u equal the whole denominator? Or? Uh, no. Just, just p squared. Okay. Well, that's going to be a problem because then you're going to have to accommodate the rest of the denominator somehow. But as Katie said, you're going to, if you let u equal p squared, which is what we would have, then du would be 2p dp. We don't have a p in the numerator. Okay. So that throws it out. The other thing is that we've got a term that has p in the denominator, which also kind of confounds that process. But those are good thoughts. I mean, to think, is there a way I can avoid this? Those are, those are valid things. But I think we're missing some terms that we need in certain places, and we have extra terms in certain places where we don't want them to be. So I, I don't think that's going to get us anywhere. But it's, you know, if it takes a few seconds to run that process through your mind and then you throw it aside, that's fine. Nothing at all wasted. Believe me, if we didn't have to do partial fractions on this, I would not propose that we do partial fractions. So L is a number. You talk about something that is going to look ugly, this is really going to look ugly because everything's going to be a letter. So you kind of have to remind yourself that the L's are numbers. So we're really dealing with something that looks like this because now we're going to add some more letters. How are we going to add letters? A, a, which is some unknown constant that we're hopefully going to find. It actually works out pretty nicely. A over P and B over L minus that's a mass of letters, right? <laughs> a is a number. B is a number. L is a number. So the P's are the X's of old. 
What's next in the partial fractions? And this times P. Yep. So the denominators are now the same. So let's equate the numerators. <coughs> BP, that all-American gas station. What's BP stand for? British, British Petroleum. Don't let them fool you. It's not American. <laughs> Just like I saw an interesting ad on TV it was about RBC Bank, and then the the email, or the web presence was rbcusabank.com. Well, what's RBC stand for? Royal. Royal Bank of Canada. Okay, so don't let them fool you by never identifying what those things are. They're they're not American. Okay, British Petroleum is not American. Um, RBC is not American. It's Royal Bank of Canada even though they say, add something USA at the end. I mean, it's not. Uh, not that I'm against them, but I mean, they, they never tell you that. So there probably is a reason why they never tell you that. All right, let's distribute everything. So. Um, What do we do from here? Remember, the P's are the B minus a. variables, so we need to put those together, yeah. right? So if we factor out a P here, then that would leave what? B minus A? And then we've got a A times L. Well, let's equate things left side and right side. How many P's do we have on the left side of the equal sign? Zero. Zero. We don't have any P's over here. So it must be true that B minus A is equal to zero. How many L's do we have on the left side of the equation? One. So it must be true that A is one. So that's easy. If A is one and B minus A is zero, then B is also one. So back to our decomposition, which is right there. We can take this left side of the equation. I told you this would take a couple of minutes, more than a couple of minutes to get there. You're not going to have to do this, by the way. This is not a testable, testworthy type question. It takes too long. But I, I have always tried in my classes, and I will continue to try to do this, that when we have a starting point on a formula or function, if we've had the background that covers how we get there to our end product, I think it's worth class time to show how we get from starting point to the final equation, rather than just say, oh, here's this mystery formula, you know, trust me, you know, or trust James Stewart, the author. So let's, if we can do it, which we can, and I think it's healthy also to review things like partial fractions off and on. You will see, most of you in here would be my guess that you will take Math 341, which is a full semester course in differential equations. Um, you will also use this quite frequently, decomposition into partial fractions, in that course. Many of you will also take a second full course in differential equations, which is Math 401. So you will see that used some in Math 401 as well. So it's not like we can learn this in 241 and eh, it was good while we were in 241, but you know, I don't want to clutter my mind with it later. You will see it and use it again. All right, so for A, we're going to put in 1. For B, we're going to put in 1. So the left side of the equation becomes 1 over P plus 1 over L minus P. Is that correct? Where we had L over <coughs> P times the quantity L minus P, we've now decomposed that into partial fractions. So we should at this point be able to integrate both sides.
isn't it easier to integrate sums and differences as opposed to products and quotients? And the answer to that is yes, it is. So what's the integral of 1 over P dP? I'm going to do something here that I haven't done, and maybe some of you have had a question about this, and it, it didn't seem quite right. I've always dropped the absolute value symbol because we're going to lose it eventually anyway, but let's keep it in this case to a point in the problem where we all agree it's okay to get rid of it. So I'm going to keep it, and you'll see we won't have to on other examples keep this because we're not ever um, potentially going to have the natural log of zero or a negative number. Um, this one, you might want to think through that a little bit. So if this is this is the number, L's the number. So if this is like 100 minus x, what would be the integral of 1 over 100 minus x? Negative, because we'd need a negative 1, right? Because we've got a minus x, and if that's our u thing, the derivative of u would have a negative in it. So we'd have to put a negative there, compensate with a negative out in front. So there's where that negative's coming from. This is probably why I felt like it would be a good problem for us to keep the absolute value because it might seem a little more obvious that this could be negative, um, especially if the figure started with the population being larger than the limiting value, it would settle down to the limiting value. So let's keep it. Possibility of a C over here, we'll roll that to the right side. The integral of k integrated with respect to t is kt. We'll put a c over there. Uh, this is typically where I fail to do something in this problem, but I'm constantly reminding myself to do this in this problem. It works out a whole lot better. Uh, we do have the difference of two natural logs. What is the difference of two natural logs the same thing as? <laughs> right the natural log of their quotient, right? So if we have the natural log of A minus B, we know that is the natural log of A minus the natural log of B, right? So if it's true in that direction and it's an equation, it ought to be true in the other direction. So if we have the difference of two natural logs, it ought to be the natural log of their quotient. I don't want this one in the denominator. I want this one in the numerator eventually, and you'll see why. So let's multiply both sides by negative 1. It works if you don't do this, but it's not as easy at the end. So the negative term becomes positive, and the positive term becomes negative over here. That's kind of the reason for doing it. And I know negative, a constant, is still a constant, but let's just keep the negative C because we did start with a C, and I guess there's a homework problem where that's an issue too. Hopefully we'll get a chance to look at that. Um, so having started with C, we've now negated it. So the natural log, excuse me, the difference of these two natural logs is the natural log of their quotient. Anybody see a reason why you might want the L minus P in the numerator as opposed to the denominator? See an advantage? Couldn't we write this as L over P minus P over P, right? Because we have a sum and difference in the numerator. You can't do that if you have a sum and difference in the denominator. So that potentially is going to be helpful to us. Uh, once we have a natural log, what do we typically do at that point? Okay, exponentiate both sides. So e to the natural log of that absolute value quantity is. And over here, we've got e to the negative kt times e to the negative c. E to the E's a number, negative C's a number. So 
that becomes a number. Now, that's, that's when we can get rid of the absolute value. And in fact, let me just write it down here. E to the negative C would be this. If I want to get rid of the absolute value, can't I get rid of the absolute value by putting a plus or minus over here? Whichever one's appropriate, right? If it's negative, I want to negate it and make it positive. If it's positive, I want to leave it alone. So we can now drop the absolute value because we're absorbing the fact that if it's ne negative, we want to negate it. Positive, we want to leave it alone. So we can drop those at this point in time. And all that, whether it's plus or minus, this is a number, this is a number, all that can be absorbed into some unknown number. Might be positive, might be negative. So we can carry them for a while. You don't have to carry them. You can, that, that becomes kind of a dead issue here at the end of the problem. But... So let's do that division, which is the reason for negating both sides earlier in the problem. So L over P minus P over P. So that's L over P minus 1. Keep in mind the goal is to solve for P. I don't like where P is in this fraction at this point in time, but we're going to be able to work that out real nicely. Let's get at least the term that has P in it by itself. <clears throat> so we'll add 1 to both sides. So we now have the term that has P in it isolated. Uh, is it okay to flip the left side? As long as if we've got two things that are equal, if we flip the left side, we better flip the right side. So the right side is really this over 1, right? It's a sum, so you can always put anything over 1, especially if we want to flip it. So that becomes P over L when we take the reciprocal of the left side, the reciprocal of the right side. Is that and now multiply both sides by L. So there's our final mathematical model from the original logistic growth equation. Again, not a test question, but there are some important things reviewed there that uh, I think are valuable. Plus, we see that it, it's not some mystery formula. So let's take a problem. So that's logistic growth. So if you see up here in the numerator, you see a 500,000, then 500,000 must be the limiting population. Okay, so that's pretty easily identifiable. Um, let's take a problem that was actually in the book a little bit earlier. This was in a prior, this data set was in a problem earlier in Chapter 7, but let's take this data and adapt it to our purposes right here. This is the U.S. population at 10-year intervals in millions. And let's pick some values that we're going to use as data points and then come up with what we think is a reasonable, I mean, we're doing the problem, we can make up our own numbers. So what do you think, based on this data for the U.S. population, come up with a good limiting value for the population of the United States? $500 million, $600 million? Population in 2000 was 275 million. Anybody have a 
have a preference. Five hundred million. Sure. That'd be all right. We, we're determining this. So we'll just do everything in millions, so we don't have to actually write in five hundred million and two hundred and seventy-five million. So the answer we get when we're done will be in millions. So our equation. So let's pick a couple of data points that we think will help us, and let's predict the population, let's say, in the year 2010. So what data points do you want to use? And let's try to be a little bit discerning about a data set that we want to use to predict. Here, here's what I'm talking about. But let's not use 1930 to 1940 to predict the population in the year 2010. Why not? I know this is a math class, but let's put a little historical context on it. That's the depression, okay? So population growth rate during that interval was probably not very large. Therefore, to use that as a predictor, we might get the population in 2010 to be actually less than it is in the year 2000. So, all right, so let's say I don't, we don't want to use 30 to 40. How about 1950 and 1960? I don't think we should use that data set either. Why not? The baby boom in the 50s, right? All the servicemen got home from World War II. They were really happy to see their wives, <laughs> and soon thereafter, we had a population growth. I'm sitting here right now because I was one of those. Um, I was actually an unplanned child. Uh, my father told me, I always kidded him, um, he's passed away now, but I told him that I was the best mistake he ever made. Uh, he didn't like to hear that. But um, we probably don't want to use 50 and 60 because we, a similar reason, 30 to 40 was a low growth rate, 50 to 60 was a very high growth rate. So I don't know. You want to use 80 to 90, 90 to 2000, 70 to 80. 70 to 90? Yeah, okay, that? let's do that. So here's our time zero. We're starting the clock in our problem. We get to choose when we have a data <coughs> set like this. So this becomes our initial population for our problem that we're starting. And then we're going to go to 1990, which is time 20, and this will be our population later. So our model so far So at time zero, population is 203 million. At time 20, the population is 250 <coughs> million. And we want to know the population at 2010. And that would be time 40, right? 40 years from. from our time zero. So we're used to plugging in data points. It's a little bit more cumbersome in this because of the where the variables are, but just let your calculator do the ugly work. So the population at time zero, let's plug in t equals zero and the population at time zero. So population is 203. So the nice thing about it, we don't know what k is, but it doesn't matter because we're multiplying it by 0, so it's gone. So this will help us solve for a. e to the 0 is 1, so we just have a 1 plus a here. So how do you want to solve this? Multiply by 1 plus a. Or, yeah, okay, plus a. basically cross multiply. So 203 times 1 plus a, and 500 times 1. So 
subtract 203. I'm going to write this out so we can compare it to something that's in the book. Divide both sides by 203. Think about how we got here with the limiting value being 500 million. Do you think in all cases that A is going to be the limiting value minus the initial population divided by the initial population. Yes, it will be. Now, that's something that if you chose to memorize that, that would, could be useful and we avoid what we just did, but it's not like it's real cumbersome. So that's what A will be all the time. So what is that? Just, um, I don't know how much to use as a decimal here. What's how ugly is that decimal? 1.463054187. Okay, let's, let's use it. 1.46305? <laughs> mm-hmm. So that's our A value. <coughs> so we now have this much of the equation. So we move to our second data point, which is 20 years after our time zero, the population is 250 million. So we put in 20 for T. We could cross multiply. Uh, let's go ahead and divide by 250. Five hundred divided by two fifty, not very nicely, is two. Kind of lucked into that. Subtract 1 from both sides. Divide both sides by 1 point. And now that we've got the term that has the variable in it isolated, we can take the natural log of both sides. Natural log of the left side is negative 20k. Natural log of the right side. We'll push buttons to get that at some point in time. And then we want to divide both sides by negative 20. So our second data, first data point gave us A, pretty common, a little bit more work in this case, but pretty common that it gives us that A or B or whatever. P0 or Y0, sometimes we just plug it in. Uh, second data point usually gets you the K in the problem, and then you, then the only thing you have left is T, and you plug in new values of T to kick out new values of population. <laughs> so we have that K is what? Point zero one nine zero three. Point zero. One nine zero three. Agreement on that? We're getting lots of those? Okay. So now our model So K turned out to be a positive number, but in the equation we have the negative of K, right? So we can throw in a t value, t is the only variable on the right side. We plugged in L, we kind of estimated limiting value. We found A and we found K. So if we want t equals 20, population is whatever, then we plug it into this equation. So the population is what we're looking for.
and it's basically pushing buttons, right? It's already solved for P. We don't have to do any algebra. Just push the buttons in the right order. So this should give us the population. Oh, no, 20, do we? 40. We want 40. Sorry. If you did 20, by the way, we better get what? 250 because we threw that in as a data point, so that confirms that. That's what I was really trying to do, just confirm the data. Not really. So if we put 40 in like we're supposed to, then we should get the population. Since our time zero in the problem was 1970, What's it give us? 297. <laughs> More? If you use the whole. Right, so that's millions, right? So if we're just trying to get an estimate, which we're using data to try to predict, so uh, I think that's going to under predict because we're at 2009, and I think I heard last week on the radio. I, would, I don't know why these things kind of catch my ear, but I think we're over 300 million already. I thought it was around like 316. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's that high, but I did hear 300 something, so I know we're over 300. So it underpredicted. It's a prediction. Why did it underpredict? Well, apparently the growth rate from 1970 to 1990 is not keeping par with maybe what it was from 1980. 2000, or maybe just in 1990 to 2000, the population growth rate is more. So, but it's a prediction. All right, questions on this? All right, let's see if we can diffuse a couple of the um, <laughs> web assign problems. Let's start with number three. And I, I think these are problems from the book. I don't know exactly where they are in the book. But what is 3? It's a differential equation. <coughs> dz dt plus p raised to the t plus c equals 0. Okay. Addition is bad. I don't like addition in a... Um, differential equation, but in this case, because we have zero on the right, when you kind of add or subtract whatever to move terms to the other side, it's nice because there's no other term there. So it becomes the only term on the other side. So let's send this term to the other side. Now, it sounded like in the discussion before class that some of you had had success on this and others had not. So if you had success on this one, what what did you do next? Well, let, let's talk about something before that. What, what are we going to have to do? Separate. Separate the Z's and the DZ's from the T's and the DT's. So if you don't like the T plus Z, you can change e to that power to a product, right? So we're stuck with a negative 1 out in front, but now we have an e to the t times an e to the z. So if you had some issues with this problem and you didn't go this route, I think that makes things separable. And there was some, something else about a constant that they said. Right. I think in the parenthesis it says, in the directions of the problem, it says keep C negative in the answer. But we know that plus a C and minus a C, they're the same thing because C is unknown. It could very well be positive, very well be negative. Do we need to keep going? Anybody want to keep going with this problem? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Tell me when it's to a point where... You you're feeling more comfortable than, than this moment. 
that's a Z. So we'll keep this here and keep this here. And divide by e to the z. Well, if you divide by e to the z, that's the same as multiplying by e to the negative z. And there's possibility that you could negate both sides. I don't know that that's going to be all that helpful, but it might be helpful because if you brought the negative over here, then you've got a negative that you need in the integrand, right? Is that those of you that had success on this problem? Is that something you did? Yes? Okay, multiply both sides by negative 1. Now we'll integrate both sides. Integral of the right side is e to the t, e to the t. Plus c. Mm -hmm. and we'll put our constant there, which I think is, again, part of the critical part of the solution is if we end up negating this, then leave it that way. Now, let me see. If they have a negative c in their answer, maybe they kept the negative over here. You didn't multiply both sides by the negative? Well, let's keep going with this because it certainly is valid to do, and I think there's a good reason to do it. What's the integral of e to the negative z times negative 1 integrated with respect to z? E to the negative z. E to the negative z. And back to the original problem, we had derivative of z with respect to t or in terms of t, so it would probably be our what we want is z in terms of t, right, for our final answer. Solve for z in terms of t. What's going to do that? Natural log. natural log of both sides. So the natural log of e to the negative z is negative, z negative z. z. The natural log of this entire side. Natural log of t. It's a natural log of a sum, which we can't really simplify, right? So if you chose to multiply through by a negative, you would end up with that. It, apparently, that's not the path that the <coughs> whoever did the solution manual <coughs> took. So where were we? Right here, when we multiplied both sides by a negative. Let's, let's see that we can get another answer, which obviously has got to be 100% equivalent to this. Chandra, do you have a question? Yeah, or? Um, in this, will we have to put absolute value for the natural log? Because <coughs> it's that palette thing again. Um, I think you always do. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I usually do that. I this one right. trying to think if we could ever get a negative here with this. Uh, I think to be safe, we probably should put it because you've got e to the t plus c. Um, c could be a negative number that could overtake e to the t. So there's a possibility of a negative. So probably to do that, we should put, um, I'd, I'd have to think about that some more. But that, that would, to be safe, we probably should do that. Um, if we left stuff where it was, which I think is probably the case if they had a negative C, what's the integral of the left side? Negative, negative e. e to the negative Z. And the right side? Negative e to the t. Negative e to the t plus c. So this is probably where the negative c came about by negating everything. Now we get a minus c 
but that's going to go back to And now take the natural log of both sides. And negate both sides. And again, probably the safest bet is to put absolute value there, but it sounds like it's accepting it without that. So apparently this answer and this answer are equivalent. But don't think about distribution. We can't do any distribution there with natural logs. How is the negative and, or the plus and the minus the same because we can do in the natural log? Um, because if C, let's say C is some arbitrary constant, C could very well be negative 5 in this particular version. Whereas down here in this one, C would be 5. Still, it's an arbitrary constant, okay. and it ends up being subtracted. Here, C is a negative number. Here, C is a positive number. So, uh, I don't remember the other one, but it looks like it's not going to happen today anyway. Um, so, we still have a little bit more to do with 7 5, and it, when's the web assigned due? Right. Okay, I'll change that to Monday. So if you still have issues, we can talk about that on Monday. And um, we'll clear those up and review on Tuesday, take a test on Wednesday. Have a nice weekend.